All right, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to Authors at Wharton. Uh, my name is Mike Yassim. I'm on the faculty here in management, and I'm with uh, David Potruck, a graduate of this school, who is the author of this great new book. I have read it. Uh, that's in front of you. And we're going to have a dialogue this afternoon, beginning with a fireside chat version. So it's a long, uh, long-standing tradition. Two people like us sit down and have a casual exchange. We'll probably run that for about a half an hour, and then we're going to open it up. This is video covered, so if you wouldn't mind, as you jump into the conversation, uh, strong voice, sit up in your chair, all that kind of thing. Uh, so here's the... Uh, the segue, I guess, into our discussion. Uh, Dave was actually here a few years ago, uh, undergraduate, uh, did his MBA degree, played football, was invited, as Dave, as I recall, to even try out for the Miami Dolphins, if I'm right on that. Took a pass on that opportunity. Probably good for the world you did, although I think you might have had a regret or two. Uh, worked, uh, uh, you were on the wrestling team. Later, at one point, you're actually, while well, you were an MBA student here, you were a coach for one of our undergraduate intercollegiate teams. Thank you for doing that. In years since then, Dave worked for a while for the U.S. government, for the predecessor to HHS, so health and health education and welfare, big bureaucracy back then, still is now, now na named uh, Health and Human Services. Moved over to city. Ended up going to San Francisco and joining Charles Schwab in a fairly senior role, and a few years later uh, goes into the number three position, and then number two, and held the title of Chief Executive Officer at Charles Schwab. Chuck Schwab himself remained Executive Chair, so Dave and uh, Chuck ran the company together. Pretty amazing period. We're going to be talking about that. Since then, uh, Dave, as a, as a startup guy, uh, launched an airline a couple years ago. Now is building since, uh, I think it was 06, uh, Hightower Advisors, an asset management company, kind of drawing on his time with uh, Charles Schwab, about $25 billion under management through the people Dave has brought in. Uh, he is indeed the contributor uh, in many ways to this school. One way you know in particular, across the street. How many have exercised in the Potruck Fitness Center? So Dave, thank you for your fitness center. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> Dave has been a trustee of the university. He's currently an overseer, overseer of the Wharton School, but in particular, he is now an author. And the book itself does come out of a program, a course that he's offered for the last, I think, 10 years now, as part of our executive MBA program in San Francisco. I think you all know we have one here, have about 100 students per year out there. Dave has taught in that program uh, going back now a full decade. One of the best teachers in the program has been recognized by students for that. And that teaching really went into the creation of this book, but it didn't stop with what he already had from Charles Schwab. As you will see as you read the book, he called up Howard Schultz at Starbucks. He talked to John Donahoe over at eBay, called up uh, Renee James, the president of Intel, where Dave serves as a board chair, to talk through with them and build on his own experience in leading change at Schwab to create a great model in this book, a seven-step method for getting organizations to do what they ought to do before somebody kicks them in the backside or somebody simply takes over their space in the market. So anyway, Dave, great to have you here. Thanks, Mike. We're going to start uh, uh, with the fact the whole dialogue is going to be very casual. I'm going to take you back to your Charles Schwab days. And uh, I do know in that I was in contact with you in this period that Schwab was a little slow to get fully into the internet, internet trading coming along, uh, E-Trade, a whole bunch of startups coming up from kind of below. Merrill Lynch, still at the top, $129 per trade way back to a trade through Merrill, $19 for a trade at um, a couple of these internet startups, and you were, as I recall, around $80 a trade. So talk us through, our topic is leading change, uh, from the privacy of your office when you concluded uh, sooner or later, you're going to have to lower your price point from $80 per trade. If you want to buy 1,000 shares of American Airlines, come to Dave. Dave would, char Dave would charge you $80. Uh, E-Trade was down there at 1995. 
you knew something was going to have to change, but Schwab had had an incredibly good period, double-digit annual growth last four years. It looks like it had a great business model. Nobody of the 14,999 people working there, except for you, saw the need for change. So there it is, Dave. Well, that, thank you. So first of all, it's nice of you to all come here today. I really appreciate it. I'm, I, having been here as a student, I know you have a million things to do. So I'm very flattered that you would take time to come here today and spend some time with us. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Mike and I have done this before. Uh, we, uh, Mike is my hero as a teacher. I just want to be him when I grow up. Uh, if any of you are lucky enough, if any of you are lucky enough to take a course with Mike Yassim, you know what I'm talking about. Mike's a fabulous teacher of management and leadership here at the university. Um, I've had the chance to to teach for the past uh, eight years, almost a decade. It's been a great privilege for me to to do that. Um, out of that teaching, um, I I wrote this book, and I reflected on all my experiences, and then I interviewed a dozen really amazing leaders, uh, the president, CEO of Pinkberry, you probably know about Pinkberry, uh, the CEO of JetBlue, just an, an amazing, the head of innovation at Citibank, amazing uh, a collection of men and women. Um, so going back to that period, um, of course, m and I say this somewhat humorously, somewhat not humorously, most of you can't imagine the world without the internet, but there actually was a time uh, <laughs> when there was no, no internet. And, um, and we did a little online trading at Schwab. We had software, and we did it over America Online and something called CompuServe. These were private networks before the internet. And then the internet pops up. And suddenly, uh, buying books is possible, and Amazon launches, and, and Yahoo launches with news and email over the internet. And then E-Trade launches, comes out of nowhere, brand new company, never existed before, built to do internet trading. And of course, we have this branch network, we have call centers, we have all this infrastructure, and we're used to people calling us up on the phone and placing a trade with a human being, having to input all that data. And Merrill Lynch, actually Mike, Merrill Lynch charged about $220 for a trade, mm -hmm. and we charged 80. And we used to advertise that we're 70% off Merrill Lynch. This was our value proposition, 70% cheaper than Merrill Lynch. And we had a nice business that was growing and doing pretty well. Um, and then the internet comes, and suddenly we're now the new Merrill Lynch. We're now the high price guys. And we, we launched something called eSchwab to compete with eTrade. And we were very successful with online trading through eSchwab. But we didn't let people go into our branch offices because my attitude was, well, eTrade has no branch offices. So if you want a low price, you've got to give up something. And actually, that was pretty successful. So we charged $29 at eSchwab. Um, so to make the long story short, I was get, we were, so Schwab was doing online trades at 60 or 70 bucks a trade, eSchwab at 29, eTrade at 19. That's the framework here we're talking about. And we are hugely successful. E. Schwab and Charles Schwab are number one and two in discount brokerage online trading. E-Trade is number three. So everybody thinks we're doing great. Stock has never been higher, CEO of the year, getting all kinds of awards. We're just, you know, I'm a genius. And, um, but I'm getting letters. I'm getting letters from our customers saying, you charge too much. I like to go into branch offices and do all that. You're making me have a Schwab account and an eSchwab account. It's too complicated. Why are you making me do that? And so I'm getting these letters by the dozens and then by the hundreds on a monthly basis. Now, we had millions of customers. So you could argue, who cares? So you have a couple hundred customers complaining. What difference does it make? What's the big deal? But our attitude, not just mine, but my senior leadership team, we believe that for every customer writing us a letter, there's 10 other customers that are unhappy. And you don't build a business with unhappy customers. And the ones that were the most unhappy the, were the ones that were most involved with their trading. The ones who were really actively trading were the ones most unhappy. Your best customer is unhappy. That's not a good business. So we had to make a change. The problem was making that change was going to cost us 25% of our profits. 
our profits were going to go down by 25%. And we knew if our profits went down by 25%, our stock price would go down by 35 or 40%. So we had to discuss this with our board of directors, get Chuck involved, and everybody had to be on, on board that this was the right thing to do for the long haul. But it was hard. It was really tough to figure out how to take on such a dramatic change in our business model. And if you look at companies like Borders, gone. Uh, Tower Records, gone. Blockbuster Video, gone. These are companies that couldn't make the adjustment. They couldn't figure out how to reinvent their business to embrace the internet. Not to defend, but to embrace. And so we embraced the internet. And we redid our trading, and our stock went down, and people were writing letters what a jerk we were, and the analysts were unhappy, and shareholders were unhappy, and we were stupid. And then about nine months later, a number of things had happened. Our, our new accounts jumped up. No one was leaving. People were trading more. Our profitability was back to where we thought it would take 18 months for our profitability to return. It was back in nine months. Suddenly, we're geniuses. We're really smart. <laughs> Our stock not only recovered the 40% that it lost, it doubled. It doubled from there. And, uh, and so you know, the uh, uh, history likes when things work out well. You're a genius when it works out well. So Dave, I think you were able to savor a moment the decision to go to down to the lower price point, $29.95 per trade. That all went into effect, as I recall, January 15th. And by December, the market value of discount startup 1974 originating company Charles Schwab exceeded that of Merrill Lynch that went back more than 100 years. So that, yeah. was, a, that was a good moment. Good moment. Let, let me ask uh, uh, about uh, sort of just sort of the, the micro events or kind of the, the, the detailed daily events that got from there to the fact that this was like one of the amazing transformations of that particular era. I think as you got through Chuck Schwab and got through the board, they're all set to go. You then had, again, 14,000 plus people who didn't know about your plan. And as soon as they learned about it, are going to be deeply suspicious, maybe more than that, about kind of ruining a business model that seemed to be working pretty well. And as I recall, Dave, you sent out a memo to your top 290 or 300 people and said, meet me down at an airport near this, uh, sorry, a hotel airport, an airport hotel near the San Francisco airport. It was a trading day. They're all a little bit annoyed that they're out of the office when the market is open. And talk us through what happened that day and how that fed into your decision okay. to, to go forward. So let me turn the clock back a little bit, and let me also, uh, I want to set the record straight. So first of all, to, and I mean this very sincerely, uh, my senior top leadership team of the company uh, got together, and we discussed, was this model we had with E. Schwab at $29, Charles Schwab at 60 or $70, was this sustainable over the long haul? And if you think about Lexus and Toyota Camrys, for example, they're both produced by the same company, Two companies producing two different products in the automotive industry. So we, thought of, thought, we, we sort of thought we'd have sort of the more elite Schwab version and the discount version like Toyota and Lexus. Well, that wasn't working so well, mainly because they both had the last name Schwab. And so that got very confusing for people. So we concluded this is not sustainable. We're going to have to put this together at some point. And, and then... The next conversation we had was with Chuck, and I explained to him what was going on with all the letters we were getting and the fact that we didn't think we had a sustainable model. And he was all over the idea that we have to fix this. You know, Our business is built around doing the right thing for customers. So, so Chuck was on board immediately. Uh, the board was concerned about the loss in stock price, but if Chuck was in favor, they were behind it. So that was accomplished. Now I got to get the rest of the employees on board. And the truth of the matter is, their, their first question was, are there going to be layoffs? And what does this mean for our, our salaries and our bonuses? Are we going to, I mean, if we're going to go through two years, 18 to 24 months of bad profits, it's going to wipe out our bonuses. Are we going to adjust the bonus plan? 
And I said, no, we're not going to adjust the bonus plan. When things are going well, we don't adjust the bonus plan. So this is an adversity. We have to just have the same bonus plan, suck it up, and get through this. And when things come out the other end, we're going to be a stronger company. We'll be great. So um, we, we gathered the leadership team of the company uh, in a hotel down by the airport. And, and we started talking about the changes we had to make. And what I did to start that day was I brought in an author who had written a book about the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, the Golden Gate Bridge was built in the 1930s during the Depression. And, and nobody thought it was possible to build a suspension bridge that could go across something that big. It was the largest suspension bridge in the world for a long time. People thought it was impossible. Secondly, when bridges of that kind of magnitude were built, typically hundreds of people died because they fell off. They had this big thing, and they just fell to their deaths. And so the people behind this bridge said, number one, we're going to build the largest bridge in the world, and we think it's possible. Number two, we're going to put thousands of people to work in the middle of the Depression. That's a good thing. And number three, we don't think anyone has to die. We're going to have, we're going to have new innovations around safety that's going to prevent people from dying. Only four people died on, on the construction of this bridge. And so I had this guy come in to talk about doing the impossible, to talk about what it means to take on challenges that have never been done before, and, and to be inspirational, to get everybody in that moment where we're going to do something truly great. We're going to invent a new company. We're going to take our 20-year-old our company, and we're going to reinvent it. We're going to embrace the internet. We're going to build it into everything we do. And yes, we'll have a, maybe a year or two of tough years, but we're going to, we don't think we have to do a major layoff. We're going to have to shrink down our hiring, of course, and maybe shrink our salaries a little bit. But we don't think we have to do a big layoff. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to reinvent our company. I had four customers come in. And they talked about how they were dissatisfied with the service of Schwab. Now, I could tell people we had to make a change, and it would have been sort of believable. But four customers coming in, four of our best customers had been with us for years, coming in saying, I've lost faith in your company. I thought your company stood for great service. I've lost faith in the service and the quality and the, 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 um, uh, the value that you deliver. Why, why is it I can go to E-Trade for 19 bucks and you're charging me 60 or $70? It's just It's not right. It's just not right. So everybody got pretty excited about this and got pretty, pretty um, inspired. And when you're leading breakthrough change, you need more than motivation. Motivation is if you behave this way, I'll give you money. That's usually what motivation is. It's rewards. It might be promotions. It might be recognition. But it's behaviors for rewards. Inspiration <laughs> is I want to be a part of something great, something special, something that's going to change the world. And so we had to convince everyone that this was a moment in time, a moment in history. We would never forget this. We're going across, and there's no going back. We're jumping the chasm, and there is no going back. And so we got in a bunch of buses, and we went out to the Golden Gate Bridge, and we symbolically walked across that bridge. And I gave everyone a really nice windbreaker. Of course, it was about 90 degrees that day. We're all sweating because these windbreakers, because usually it's 60 degrees on the bridge. And we all walked around across the bridge, and we gathered on the top of the hill right in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. And we took a photo and said, this is the team that will be remembered for the reinvention of our company. And it was a special moment. Let me take it forward with one final question on, on this particular period. That was in October. January 15th does arrive. It's a dramatic announcement. Well kept secret ahead of time. It's all right. Okay. I'll put that over here. And, it uh, had to be a well-kept secret because we're a public company, and if people knew we were going to drop our price, it, it would have it created killed havoc on, totally. on our so, trading of our stock. Huge event, January 15th. It is headlines around the world. Schwab's dropping its price for a trade from $70 down to $29.95. That was a headline. Uh, they say in leadership in general and leading change in particular, uh, you've got to have a constitution that is uh, resilient. So... How did it feel on January 16th, Dave? Well, I told Mike this many times. I slept like a baby. I woke up every two hours and I cried. Uh, <laughs> that's how that worked. So uh, 
did you, let me take that forward. Uh, that, um, in fact, I saw you, Dave, right in, that, in the middle of that period, and I know it was a moment of some anxiety. Mm -hmm. When did you come to appreciate that it really was going to turn the corner the way it did, in fact, within nine months and not two years that you had initially projected out? So. Well, you know, it was actually very disappointing in the beginning because we trade, we changed our price. I mean, literally one day we're charging 60 bucks or 80 bucks, the next day we're charging 29, and of course our revenues dropped, and behavior didn't change. I, didn't, I thought people were gonna trade more because we believed there was an elasticity of demand. If we drop the price, people want more. So we thought people would trade more if we dropped the price, and we didn't see it. And I was like, oh man. And, and nothing happened right away. When you're doing this, you think right away it's gonna really, but it doesn't. It, it takes a little while. People are trading. Some people didn't even know we dropped the price in there until they saw their confirm. They said, oh man, that only cost $19. That, wow, what a great, I mean, they don't pay attention. They're not, they're not even aware. But about two or three months into it, suddenly we start to see the trading, the trades per day are starting to really go up. And about three, four, five months into it, Mike, it was like, oh, this is, this is happening faster than we thought. This is going to be really good. And it was, it was very exciting to see. One of the great values, by the way, of Dave's book is that it comes from this and other experiences he's had. He describes himself as an operating guy, but he doesn't limit his thinking to his own experience. And as we said at the outset, he spent time with Howard Schultz, how many of you are Starbucks customers? Probably all the hands should be going up. And uh, you're all Intel customers, and you're all eBay customers on one side of that uh, trade or not, or the other. So uh, Dave, just a, a question in particular. As you spend time with John Donahoe, the guy that runs eBay now after Meg Whitman, uh, Renee James at Intel, the president, and then, of course, Howard Schultz at great company that we know he runs, uh, what did you learn from them that you had not really previously appreciated as you thought about your own change model? Well, Howard uh, uh, is not someone I knew before. Uh, I was actually introduced to Howard by another friend of mine. And um, he was gracious enough to give me some of his time. Uh, he really emphasized corporate culture. He was explaining to me how important it is to build a corporate culture around certain values that everybody holds dear and everyone believes in. And he felt um, that Starbucks had become all about the numbers and not enough about the coffee experience and the store experience of the customer. And so he, 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 he was CEO and founder. Then he left, the comp he left that job and became the chairman. And he felt like the company was sliding. So he stepped back in as the... Um, as the CEO, and he, when he stepped back in to turn around the company, he emphasized culture. He had a meeting of all 30,000 store managers. All of them came to New Orleans to discuss the future of Starbucks and that it was all about the coffee, all about the customer. And he challenged his store managers. He said to every store manager, I need you to get one more customer a day. One more customer a day. Five bucks. Each customer in Starbucks averaged five dollars. One more five dollar transaction today, another five dollar transaction tomorrow. That's your job. Your job is to figure out how to increase the value of the customer experience so we get one. He thought everybody could relate to that. I mean, millions of dollars of revenue, who can relate to that? But the store managers, your job, Mike, tomorrow. You need to improve that experience and get one more customer. And the next day, one more customer. And let's build something, build it and rebuild our stores. He also um, talked about the quality of the product. I mean, your product quality has to be something that everybody in the company can be proud of. It's really important to have pride in the quality and belief in what you do. We're not just selling something. We're selling something we believe in. We're selling something we would be proud to give to our family, our friends, anyone in our life. And he felt the quality of the coffee at Starbucks had slipped. So he closed all the stores. Every single Starbucks was closed for two hours for barista training on how to make a good cup of coffee. And 
that was a real statement to everyone in the company, that the company was sh shutting down for two hours to say, this is how you make a great cup of coffee. This is how you make an espresso and a latte and all those other crazy things. You have to speak a special language, as you know, if you go to Starbucks. <laughs> um, uh, so so uh, that's what I learned from Howard. It was all about the importance of culture. What I learned from John was really interesting. When John Donahoe took over from Meg Whitman at eBay, eBay was struggling. And um, of course, Meg and her team uh, had built an amazing company. And then the company started to slide. And John came in, and a few years later, Meg left. And John felt there was a turnaround that was needed. And what he said to me was, Dave, you know, the people who have led for the, have built eBay, they can't rebuild what they built. Just, they just couldn't. They couldn't look, step back and look at the company that was now not succeeding and reinvent the model they had created. And he said, he, these people, I had to change them out. I had to bring in a new team. That team reinvented eBay to, I think, John tripled or quadrupled the stock price and really rebuilt eBay. He said, the people who left went somewhere else and had great careers. They couldn't reinvent change at eBay, but they could go someplace else and reinvent change. And, and he really felt that um, the ability to lead change is circumstantial. Sometimes you can do it in a certain situation and not necessarily in, in other situations. And Renee James uh, really talked to me a lot about uh, um, um, leadership communications. She talked to me about the fact that um, the employees have to feel the passion of the leader. They have to believe that uh, people don't follow ideas necessarily, they follow people. And so when you're up there and you're giving a speech or you're talking to your team or how big an audience you have, and you might think it's all about how I'm explaining this idea, it's really all about how you're selling yourself. It's all about people deciding that you're trustworthy, that they connect in you, connect with you, that they believe in you. If they believe in you, they'll follow your idea. If they don't believe in you, it doesn't matter how good the idea sounds. They may have stopped listening 10 minutes ago. They need to believe in you. And the message has to be delivered over and over again. If I was here with all of you, and you were my team, my leadership team in a company, a group like this size, and I was telling you how we were going to make a big change, what we're doing isn't good enough. We're, we're at... Uh, we're at Blockbuster Video, and Netflix is starting to eat our lunch. And we're going to reinvent our stores. We're going to close half of them. We're going to get into streaming videos. We're going to make some huge changes to really capture the opportunity and defend against the threat. About halfway through that, half of you have now tuned out. You didn't even listen to the last part of the conversation. <laughs> You're thinking, what does this mean to me? What does this mean to my job? What does this mean to my people? What does this mean to what I do every day? How am I going to, what do I have to tell my spouse at home? What is this going to mean for my, my salary, my job security? They're not listening anymore to what you're saying. So you're going on and on and on about how this is going to be wonderful, and everybody's thinking, well, what does it mean to me? So as the leader, you have to be thinking about your audience and, and, and where they're coming from and look for opportunities to speak to them from where they're coming from. And you also need to be prepared to share your message over and over and over. Here's another thing I would say to you. You can remember this phrase. You earn the right to communicate electronically by the frequency <coughs> and quality of your face-to-face -face communications. What I mean by that is, as a leader, if you think communicating uh, about a change or communicating something happens when you hit send on your email, you're wrong, okay? You want to have be believable in email, you better get in front of the people you're communicating with in person and talk to them because they read your face, they read your body language, they're looking for your belief. They're looking for whether I can trust you and then everything else that follows is more believable but first they have to trust you, they have to believe you, and that doesn't happen through email. 
It happens in person. And there's just no, there's no replacement for that. You can't do it all the time. I get it. We live in a worldwide global economy. People's companies are all over the place. I get that. But what I'm just simply trying to say is you have to spend some of your time out in public or with your people talking face to face. Don't think face to face goes away. We're going to open this up in just a minute, so be ready with a couple questions. Uh, Dave, final question at this point from me. A lot of ways to learn how to manage, a lot of ways to learn how to lead uh, attending one of our programs. That's a good idea. Reading this book, also a great idea. Taking Dave's course, if you're out in San Francisco and the executive MBA program, that's good. But Dave, I happen to know also that uh, in your own learning to manage and to lead, you've had a couple very significant mentors along the way. So pick one, help us appreciate who that person was and what did you, what did you learn? Well, so I got promoted. I was the, I was the, um, uh, the uh, president of the Charles Schwab brokerage firm in 19, I was promoted in 1988 to be the president of the brokerage firm. I worked for the president of the company. So I was a division president. He was the holding company president and chief operating officer. In 1992, he had a heart attack. And I got promoted to being the president and chief operating officer of the whole company. And I realized that this was a big promotion for me and that I was going to have to do a lot more leadership communications inside the company. And so I, I looked around to try to find a speech writer to help me communicate. And so I was referred to a guy named Terry Pierce. So I bring Terry in, and I say to him, Terry, look, I, uh, I have um, a speech I have to give in a couple of weeks to about 150, 200 Schwab executives. And I'd like you to help me with this speech. I want to talk about the changes we have in our mutual fund program and why that's going to be great for the company and how we're going to have to really embrace mutual funds and maybe stock trading is going to be as important, and we have to really build our funds business, and that's the future of the company. And he says, well, Dave, um, before we get there, I, I'd, I, let's take a step back. I, I want you to tell me about yourself. Who are you? What, is, what have been the formative experiences in your life? You know, what, what's made you who you are today? I said, Terry, I'm not looking for, for a biography. I'm, I'm looking for a speech. <laughs> So I don't, well, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the speech. He said, I don't think you get it, Dave. You know, that's not how I work. I said, well, well how do you work? I, I, what do you mean? How, how do you work, Terry? Don't you just, I, I mean, I tell you the ideas. You write them down. You make them sound great. And then I, I read your speech. He said, no, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. First of all, you're not reading anything. Secondly, I need to know who you are. Because you have to be worthy of people's trust. You have to share with your audience why why this matters to you. You have to reveal who you are and what you got to talk about yourself. It's not a question of being egotistical. It's talking about yourself in a way that makes you believable, that makes you credible. That's what we have to do. Who are you and why do you care? That's what you have to share with people. You have to be willing to reveal yourself, to be worthy of trust, worthy of commitment. I said, OK, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> uh, and so he was a very compelling guy. And we worked together for the next 12 years. Um, and it was, he, he really helped me. You know, I, I remember there were times when, you know, he, we were, the way we usually worked together was after, after you know, I got past this initial period, he got to know me and blend me into all my speeches and so forth. And then whenever I'd want to talk about something, we'd get together and I'd tell him what I want to say, and he would write out a speech. He would write out a speech, and I would read it over and over, but then I'd never read it to the audience. I would just read it because, and I do this even to this day, most of the time when I give a speech, I write out, I write out the speech longhand. And the reason I do that is because it forces me to think through the precision of exactly what it is I want to say, exactly what I want to say. As opposed to, and I, I start with notes, bullet points, then I write it out, 
Then I go back to the bullet points, okay? Because now I just need the thought joggers to help me remember the sequence of what I want to cover. But I never read a speech, never read a speech. People don't want to hear you read a speech. They want you to be authentic. And one of the things Terry always said to me is, people won't remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel, right? And that's, that's a wonderful Maya Angelou quote also. Remember how you make them feel. So again, people, it's about people trusting you, then they'll trust your ideas. Dave, I'm going to add a personal note uh, to maybe close off that point that we're going to open it up. I had invited Dave to speak to the executive MBA class in San Francisco quite a few years back now when he was still chief executive at Charles Schwab. And I personally will never <laughs> forget this moment. You probably didn't even register on it at the time. Uh, but you spoke to the 100, 105 students. Terry Pierce, his coach and mentor, just described, was in the room. And the chief executive of Charles Schwab, at the end of the speech, came back to Terry and said, Terry, how did I do? What, would I, what should I have done differently? And so for me, anyway, it was such a good moment of reminding us all that managing and leading is a pretty much a, a self-directed, lifelong agenda. Let's open it up. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, strong voice. I need to get you on the air here. Uh, we do, by the way, have uh, the opportunity to come in by Twitter, I am told, and I'm going to forget what the hashtag is. Somebody tell me, authors of Wharton. So if you have a thought, send it in. But in the meantime, uh, just identify yourself. Let us know what class you're in, which program you're in, and we'll take it from there. So who would like to start? Right back here in that. Yes. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming. Um, I guess uh, my question is around you know this uh, experience that you took your leadership team through at Schwab. Um, it seems like a really great bonding experience, but also something that you can't do every time there's a change that your company needs to kind of go through. Uh, and if you do it too often, it, it loses the power of that sort of bonding experience. And so I guess trying to understand on the one hand, what was your thought process when you realized this can't just be another, another memo, another communication. It has to be something more transformative. And if you've helped other leaders think through you know, a big challenge, a big obstacle that they face, and how you help them determine uh, the way in which to, to try to you know, galvanize their, their own uh, leadership teams. Your name and school? Uh, Rob Struck. Uh, I'm in the MBA program uh, first year, and I had the privilege of taking a class with Professor Yusim last semester. You're in the executive MBA program? Uh, no, the regular, regular MBA. MBA program. Yeah. OK, Rob. Rob? Yes. OK, thanks, Rob. So um, look, you have to be good at incremental change if you want to be competitive in today's world, period. You have to be good at incremental change. You're always doing things that are making you more effective, more efficient, more productive. At the margin, you are always looking for those things. Every year, you have an agenda for change. We're going to have to change things, make ourselves more efficient. How do we get more done with less resources or do more with the same resources? That's standard. That's what we have to do. That's everyone's job. Not all the time, but occasionally, there is an opportunity or a threat that demands a change. So in my case, that happened three times in my career at Schwab. Once was um, when I believed that our branches, our offices, we had 75 offices at the time, Schwab has multiples of that today. We had 75 offices, and everyone in the office took phone calls for trades, and the rest of the time, they literally sat around and read a newspaper. Our average customer had, had $7,200 in his account. And I believed that our average customer, I knew for a fact that our average customer had hundreds of thousands of dollars, but had all that money somewhere else. So they maybe had a Merrill Lynch account for their serious money, and the Schwab account was for their speculative money. Well, I wanted to get the rest of that money. I said, we got we to gotta get to know our customers better so they trust us 
with more of their money. Maybe, I mean, as, if it went from 7,200 to 10,000, it would be a home run. But how about getting that IRA every year, another $2,000, and suddenly it's 15 and $20,000. So I sold Chuck um, on this idea of reinventing the branch network to something more um, successful, more creative, more um, uh, contributing, not just as an op center, but as a revenue generator. So this was an opportunity, not a threat. It was an opportunity. I, I believed we could do that. And so that was number one. And that was really hard. And I screwed that up totally. That took 10 years. It should have taken three or four. And I approached it the wrong way. I talked about the fact we were going to get into the soft selling business. I never should have used the word selling. I should have said, we're going to get in the relationship building business or improve the quality, expand the definition of customer service. But I violated the culture of our company. Schwab was an anti-sales culture. We sold on the notion of no salesman will ever call you. That was in our ads. You remember those ads in the 1980s? Those were the ads we ran. So I flew right in the face of the culture of our company. And so I made, I made that take three, two or three times longer than it should have. That was opportunity number one. That was 1985. The stock market crashed in 1987, and we had just gone public. We didn't get above our IPO price for four years. And after the market went down, and most of you, you're all virtually too young to remember this, but the market dropped 500 points, 20%, 20% in one day, one day. And it was a cataclysmic event to see the market drop like that in one day. Nobody wanted to trade stocks for years, for years. But people have to invest money somewhere. So all the, all the investing went to mutual funds. Schwab didn't have a mutual funds operation. So we had to invent a new way to trade mutual funds. And we did that. So that was defensive. And that happened in 1991, 1992, so five years later. And then came the opportunity for the internet in the mid to late 1990s, 96, 7, 8. So three times in those 15 years, every five years, something happened that we energized the company about. And I would say that the, the first one I did very poorly. The second one I did better, OK. Third one, pretty good. So I kept getting better. <laughs> Is that a microphone for this gentleman? <laughs> And do introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, well, my name is Javier. Javier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good, good memory. Uh -huh. I'm uh, working in MBA class 2016. Well, my question is, um, can you please describe how did you get the idea that the internet was so huge? Because for us, it's like internet is, OK, w some people grew with, with the internet. Uh, some people was born when, when the internet was right. OK. Uh, but, but in your case, the internet was just developing. Um, did, did you receive like a fax from some guy that said, I don't know, or, or, or a letter from some guy that said, this is huge? Or, or what, 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 what was the variable that you, that you just say, yeah. OK, this is, this is so great. Yeah, we it, have to go It's actually a great question. It is. And yeah. um, I mean, you know, now all of us uh, know about Twitter, and we all know about Facebook and Facebook seems like such an obvious idea. You know, of course you want social networking with all that kind of stuff, and yet it didn't exist until Mark Zuckerberg invented it. In fact, he wasn't the first. There were other social networks like that. I forget what they were all called, and they all disappeared, right? So, um, you know, we, what we used to say at Schwab, and this was true was where a high-tech company happens to be in the brokerage business. So all of us who worked with Schwab in the 80s and 90s were really tech-oriented guys. We, we were conversant about computers. We could all talk about computers and the role of technology and the role technology plays, and we need to automate more things. And we were putting, we were trying to develop automated ways to give quotes and do all kinds of stuff. And we had online trading software as I said, since 1985, we had online trading software. Um, so we were technologically oriented. And then when we, I, I can't tell you why 
we saw the internet as the next big thing, but we did. We did. We sat around. I mean, here we are, and we're trying to figure out what we're going to do, and, and are we really going to cut our prices by 70%? And, and we looked at each other and said, this is, this is the big thing in our, in, our, in our generation. This is the big one. And let's, let's not defend against it. Let's exploit it. Let's reinvent. I mean, today, no customer calls Schwab and asks for a quote. If you want a quote, either you go to CNBC and turn on the television, or you, you look on your phone. I mean. In those days, at the end of the day, every day, we had tens of thousands of phone calls from customers saying, what did IBM close at? What did Dow close at? Thank you. Goodbye. They used to call us at the end of the day to, to, to find out what happened in the stock market. There were no TV shows. There was no CNBC. And there was no internet. And so we, we looked at it and said, this is going to eliminate. We're going to save money. We're gonna, people are going to open accounts online. People are going to trade online. They're going to look up their balances online. They're going to move money. They're going to self-serve. All that stuff's going to change. And we'll take our people, and we're going to have to make them give more advice to customers and not take orders, but give help. And so Schwab tried to re start reinventing <laughs> itself around giving help and moving everything to the internet. So I can't tell you. It's a great question, Javier. But I think we all, we all said this is, this is the big thing in our generation, and, and, and we were right. The question right here? Or is it, get a microphone, or someone have a microphone? Yeah, we got one, it's, it's coming. Yeah, just send the microphone Why don't you give here. this guy a mic? It's coming. We'll go here Hello. and then over Hello. there. Okay, hold on a second. Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Emily Chisholm. I'm a junior undergrad in Wharton, and I'm actually with Wharton Magazine. Um, but just as an undergrad taking an MBA class in sustainability, something we're talking about is how a quarter or even a week is an eternity in markets like these for stockbrokers, for the board, and for shareholders. So how, when you were making the change to, towards the internet to e Schwab, how do you sell the idea that this is a long-term benefit and that we're just going to have to take the bonus cuts and the salary um, lack of surety and know that this is good for the long term and just be OK with suffering right now? Well, so <clears throat> I mean, look, the truth of the matter is we didn't know that it was going to work out. We were making a bet. I mean, it was a bet the company, bet your job, bet your career bet, because if it didn't work, I certainly would have been fired. And no one really wants to make that kind of bet. No one really wants to bet their job or bet their career. Um, but when I looked at everything, so, so my boss, Larry Stubsky, before he left the company, he used to tell me, Dave, model it. Run the math. Don't let your intuition be used as an excuse. Because I used to say, Larry, this is my intu intuition. I'm a marketing guy. I feel this is going to be, no, no, I don't want to know what you feel. Run the math, Dave. Run the math. So we ran the math. We said, well, what do we have to believe? How many, what do we have to believe about the elasticity of trading? If we drop our price by 70%, people will trade more, right? Yeah. How much more? 50% more? Twice as much? What do we have to believe? Will we get more new accounts? Yeah. How many? Will we lose less accounts? Yeah. How much less? Can we get rid of some of our costs around giving quotes and phone calls? Yeah. How much can we save? So you start to model it out, and it gives you more confidence that this is the right thing to do. But every model we had said 18 months. It's going to take 18 months. So then you have to, so then. You, I mean, Chuck Schwab's name is on the door. He had a huge amount of passion around serving clients well. Not every CEO would have had the courage to back the move. But when I told him how unhappy our clients were and how many letters I was getting, he said, Dave, we can't build a business based upon unhappy customers. We're going to have to make this change. And I told him it would take 18 months. He said, OK, we could live with 18 months. And and, um, 
And so once Chuck was behind it, and the guy whose name is on the door, facing the ads, the board got on board with us, so that was pretty easy. And then we just had to sell it to the employees. But it was, it was hard. I mean, it is hard. Leading, leading company, I mean, uh, I have seen the same thing. I'm on the board of Intel. So here we are at Intel, and we have 85% market segment share of the PC business. We're fabulous. We're, we're you know, those, that machine, that Apple, has, a, has our chip, has, has uh, Intel chips in it. Everyone's computer in this room, I'll bet, has an Intel chip in it. And if you pull out your phone, none of them have Intel chips in them. None. Why is that? Well, because that device can have a bigger chip, larger, that's more energy consumptive, and is more powerful. And you want that for your, for your laptop. Your phone does other things that aren't as complicated in many cases, or certainly weren't before smartphones. And so we weren't making chips for phones, and we missed the whole phone business. We missed it. And we tried to go after it, and it was too late, too little, too late. No way we can get in the phone business. So then we tried to figure out, well, how can we get, uh, what about tablets? So phones, OK, maybe we can live without being in phones. But tablets are starting to erode the sales of computers. People are doing more and more on tablets, and they're doing less on their laptops. So maybe we got to get in the tablet business, because it's, you know, it's, it's the innovator's dilemma, Clay, Clay Christensen, that the guys come up from the bottom and eat your lunch. So we better draw the line in the sand at tablets, and we better figure out how to get into the tablet business. So we had to go out, and we had to do deals, manufacturing deals, mergers, acquisitions, to get ourselves quickly into the business of producing smaller, cheaper um, chips for, for tablets. And our CEO uh, that we had before, the current CEO, Brian Krasanich, he couldn't figure that out. He, he, um, he started out by saying, tablets are a fad. Tablets are a fad. Easy to be in denial. And our new CEO said, no, we got we to gotta respond to this tablet threat. And he, he's done a magnificent job. Paul Odellini, our prior CEO, was a fabulous guy. He just missed this tablet thing. He just missed it. It's, it's tough. When you have threats like that to your business, facing up to them and dealing with the d difficult choices that you have to make, strategy is all about choices. And making some of those choices are really painful, very painful. Yes, sir. Hi, um, my name is Hayato. Um, I'm a current junior in the Huntsman program. Um, and thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us today. I, I, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, you, you talked earlier about um, you know, your career at Charles Schwab and your promotion, but I was wondering about your career after graduation uh, as an undergrad, and if you could kind of expound on some of the guideposts that you had after graduation. Um, because it, you know, with the recruiting process right now on campus, it seems pretty, it, it's pretty scary for me um, of where I should go, what I should do. Um, and I was just wondering you know, if you had any thoughts that you might one day become the CEO of a huge company. Well, um, so one of the things I thought I would do, and I'm not going to do it right now, but I, I brought this with me. Uh, I, I told the people here, one of the speeches I gave a couple of years ago to a bunch of Wharton MBAs was called Dave's 10 Ideas for Achieving Mega Successful Career and a Satisfying Life. And I know you all want to hear this, so I'm holding it till the end, okay? You're not going to get it yet. Very good. Not going to get it yet. Uh, but I will go over my 10 ideas for achieving a mega success, for achieving mega success in your career and a satisfying life. But let me talk a little bit about what you just asked me. So I'll tell you the following. Um, when I graduated from Penn, I majored in psychology, and which was Im immensely beneficial because it taught me about people, about how to work with people, and what motivated people. And that was hugely valuable for me to understand that. I never had a business person I never knew a business person in my life when I was growing up. I grew up on a street where everybody, all the dads, were um, factory workers, policemen, bus drivers, um, m garage mechanics. Um, my dad worked in a factory. There were no white collar workers on my street. I, I didn't have, I, and I worked, I lived uh, in the suburbs of New York City, and I knew there was these tall buildings in Manhattan, and I couldn't even imagine what anyone did in those buildings. I couldn't imagine it, but I was sure 
it was boring as hell. I was sure of that. <laughs> I was absolutely convinced that all they did was take a piece of paper and move it from the right side of the desk to the left side of the desk, and oh my God, that just seems awful. Um, and then while I was going to Penn, I met one of my, one of my girlfriends, who later became my wife, actually. Um, her, her father was a businessman. He was the first businessman I ever met. And he was a small, he was an accountant. He had a small little accounting business. But he had a small accounting business, and all of his clients were little business. Well, this guy ran a private school. This guy had a printing business. This guy had a shoe company. They were all, and they all loved working in business. It was like, what do you love about it? Well, you compete in the marketplace every day. You innovate. You come up with new ideas. You're managing people. You're trying to grow. And, 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 you're comp and, and they kept saying, you're competing. You're competing. I said, oh, like in sports. Yeah. Like in sports, I said, oh, this might be more interesting than I thought. So I got this idea that maybe business was a possibility for me, but I still couldn't quite put it all together. So when I graduated Penn, I applied to Wharton, and I got into the MBA program, and I majored in a brand new program. They announced it just as I was applying. They announced this brand new program in healthcare administration. And my mom was a nurse. And I used to visit her in the hospital all the time. And I thought, oh, there's guys here that run this place. And that would be a kind of a cool job. So maybe that's what I could be as a hospital administrator. And so I went and got my MBA in healthcare administration. You have to understand, none of this was thoughtful. This was all, oh, I guess I'll go get an MBA. Uh, I didn't get into the NFL. I guess I'll get an MBA. So, so and my first job, I went to work for the, for the government. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. And I hated it. I hated it. So I was working in healthcare. I hated it. It was just slow. The doctors were in charge. They just made all the decisions. People like us were just second class citizens and so forth. And I, I just hated it. And my point to telling you all of this is you don't have to have this all figured out on day one. I started out my career horribly. I was working in the government. I was, I was probably the lowest paid. <laughs> I was probably the lowest paid guy to my MBA class uh, who, who had a job. I mean, maybe some people didn't have jobs. But uh, uh, when I graduated, the average salary, you'll all get a kick out of this, the average MBA salary was $17,000 a year. I was the starting salary for the MBAs of my class, and I made $14,000 a year. So I was sure I was the lowest paid of all the MBAs in my, in my class. And, um, and I probably was the lowest paid for a long time. My point is, if you believe in yourself, you can, you can get off to a bad career start. You can make a mistake. You, can get, uh, you may not get the job you want. You get this other job. But you've got to believe in yourself. And your whole life, one of the things I'm going to talk about later, your whole life, you've got to have this idea that I'm going to keep making myself better. And you have to make it explicit. You have to write down. When you graduate this place, you're not done. You're only done with the beginning. It's the end of the beginning. It's not the end of your education. It's just the end of the beginning. And now you're going to figure out every year, I'm going to read books. I'm going to join organizations. I'm going to network. I'm going to spend time. I'm going to surround myself with people who can teach me. I'm going to learn and get better all the time. You're in a race. You're in a competition. You have to learn and get better. But you don't have to start out perfect. And if the first job doesn't quite work, OK, you, get, you move on to the next thing. Dave, we're getting close to the uh, end of our time. Let's go back to Th this Ken one. Ha this one has a, has has the microphone in All right, her hands. We just take her. We'll Thank she has. She has a wonderful smile. I like her smile too. Hi, my name is Christina Ward, and I'm a second year MBA student. And I was very interested in your comment about transformational leadership and how sometimes it's circumstantial. And you juxtapose that with a comment about how you, in this day and age, you have to keep pushing, keep innovating. And I wanted to hear your thoughts, or maybe some. Um, an overview of some of your management techniques or features about the culture, um, the, um, the culture you try to cultivate that allow people to run the day to day while still um, being self disruptive. Yeah. So um, I'll answer that quickly and we'll move on. Um, so here's what I've learned, and, and Mike, I, I, I'm sure you believe this as well. 
you know, I've looked at business from every point of view. How do, we, how do you do strategy? How do you roll out strategy? Where does that execution meet strategy? And how do we innovate? And all this other stuff. But here's the one thing I've learned. It's all about people. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about people. And if you want to grow as a leader, you have to figure out how in your life you're going to be a magnet for talent. And if, you have, if you're going to be a magnet for talent, if talent is going to come and work for you and stay with you, you have to invest in that talent. You have to make them better, even as you're making yourself better. You have to make them better, too. You've got to keep developing the team around you, which means you have to be willing to delegate and let them run with it. You've got to be willing sometimes to tell them what the goal is and not necessarily tell them how to get to the goal. This was very hard for me. Because I have a lot of ideas. I think I know how to do everything. And so the idea that I'm going to tell someone, this is what I want you to do, this is the, the goal I want you to achieve, this is the output, but you're going to have to figure it out, is really hard for me. And I struggled with that in my career. And, and learning to back off and, and let people grow and let them blossom was, was challenging. And now, where I'm not an operating executive anymore, so I'm not the CEO, I'm chairman of a couple of companies, I'm on the executive committee at Intel, my job is not to tell the CEO how to do it. I, I do hold the CEOs accountable for their outcomes, and we agree on the outcomes that are going to be achieved, and I leave myself to be available as a sounding board and as a participant in discussions, but I let those people um, get it done their way. And I think you have to increasingly do that. So number one, you got to recruit talent. You gotta, your whole life, you have to be keeping track of who are the talented people you want to have work for you someday. You've got to be always a magnet for talent, a magnet for talent. And, and then secondly, you have to be developing that talent and developing yourself at the same, at the same time. Dave, terrific. 10 tips for a spectacular career. And a satisfying life. Ten tips. <laughs> Don't forget that and, and, second and a half. Uh, you know, people, I, I, I had this come about. People said to me, so you, you were an executive vice president at Schwab at age 35, and you were the, the president at age 39 and, and CEO at 45 or something like that. How did you do that? How did you do that? So I thought about what allowed me to achieve that kind of success compared to a lot of my my peers and classmates at Wharton. And you're going to be disappointed with this list. Let me just get that up front. You're going to be disappointed. <laughs> this is not like the alchemy of turning lead into gold, OK? There's some of this stuff is going to seem unbelievably pedestrian and obvious. But I'm telling you, this is what made me successful. All right, so in my case, these are the 10 things. Number one, get up early. If everyone gets up at 6, you get up at 5. Literally, you commute ahead of everyone else. Everyone spends an hour commuting. You spend a half an hour because you're not stuck in traffic. You get to the office ahead of everybody. You get, you get, you're doing your emails. Be ahead of the crowd. And, and that starts with getting up early. I used to say to my kids, first victory of the day. I still say that to myself. I don't like getting up early. I force myself to do it, which means you also have to force yourself to go to sleep at a decent hour at night so you can get up early. Number one, get up early, first victory of the day. Number two, don't be afraid to take the road less traveled. If everyone is wanting to go into Wall Street, don't go to Wall Street. Take a manufacturing job working for an automotive company in the, in, in the Midwest. Go work in Procter & Gamble. Do something different. If everyone in your class is going left, you go right. If everyone wants to figure out how to make money in China and India, you focus on South America and, the Latin, and Latin America. The point is, where everyone else is going is crowded. So when I went to work for Schwab, I mean, I left a job at American Express and went to work for Schwab. It was a division of the B of A. It had been acquired by the Bank of America for $57 million. It was tiny. People laughed at me at American Express. You're going to work for Schwab? Are you kidding? You're leaving American Express to go to work for that little division of the B of A? What are you, nuts? But I went the road less traveled. So go to road less traveled. Number three, physical energy matters. You got to find time to exercise. I know this, you know, I'm a jock. I played sports and all that. But your endurance matters. 
you, you need to work long hours. There, you can't be successful working short hours. So if you're going to be able to work long hours and stay focused and really get work done, you have to be fit. Taking the time to be fit is a good investment. You must be fit. Your energy, you have to out-energize everyone else. You have to have more energy. I don't know how to do that without eating right and exercising. Number four, think about your career five to 10 years out. Say to yourself today, what do I want to have on my resume in 10 years? Imagine your resume 10 years from now. What experiences do you want? When you go for a job interview in five or 10 years, what do you need to say to get that job you're going to want in five or 10 years? So when I was working at Citibank, I had to take a, I was a vice president in data processing and operations, and I realized I wanted to be a general manager, so I had to go work in the New York banking division, and I got an opportunity to go work and take an assistant vice president job in the credit department of the upper Manhattan region because I, the, the guy who hired me said, look, the head of this department is going to be leaving, and you can run that business, Dave, if you come in here and run operations and do a good job. And I had to first take a demotion to go, I had to step backwards to go forward. And that was not easy. But I knew that's the, ex the experience I wanted to get. Number five is you got to find something that connects with your passion, which everybody tells you, I'm sure. But it's not always obvious. I didn't really want to be in the brokerage business. I don't have any passion about investing in brokerage. It's not my passion. But my passion was helping people. My, uh, when I went to work for Schwab, um, you know, all due respect to any of you here that work at Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley uh, or think about going to work there, in those days, Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley sold whatever there was the product of the day, whether it was good for that investor or not. I worked at Shearston American Express. It was a traditional brokerage firm, and we sold the product of the day, and it was all about what was best for the broker, not what was best for the customer. So my passion was not really about investing. My passion was about helping people and the sacred trust that, that helping people invest and achieve their futures. We used to say, we're the financial custodians of our customers' dreams. And so that connected for my passion. So think about how do we connect, how does this connect with your passion? Number six, um, and I'm gonna explain this because it may seem obvious. You, you, you have to be courageous. You have to take some risks. I have failed numerous times in my career. Failure doesn't kill you. I'm here. I'm not dead. Failure doesn't kill you. I started out, I started out my first job in the government. I was mediocre. I hated it. My wife one time walked into my office and found me on the floor. She thought I had a heart attack. I was sleeping under my desk. <laughs> That's true. Have you ever heard that before? That's no true. I was so bored, I was dying, OK? <laughs> I was dying. It didn't kill me. It didn't kill me. And, and in my career, I did things. It didn't kill me. You have to take some risks. Courage is not, I don't know, it's not this unfettered bravery. Courage is a function of you're looking at the likelihood of failure and the consequence of failure. And we overestimate both the likelihood, but especially the consequence. And if you can simply ratchet down the likelihood of failure, I think I can succeed more likely, but more importantly, even the consequence of failure. I'll just pick it up and go forward. Chuck Schwab, he, Charles Schwab was his third startup. His first two failed. And he wasted about 10 years of his career, more than 10 years, with those two failures until he started Charles Schwab. So failure doesn't kill you. Be courageous. What does that mean? Maybe you take a job with a startup. Maybe you take a job like I did with a less prestigious company. Maybe you take a job in, and you don't go to Silicon Valley, and you don't go to Manhattan, you don't stay here. You take a job in Lincoln, Nebraska with some company. And you think, oh, Lincoln, Nebraska, well, I'll, I'll die there. But you know what? If you go to a place that no one else wants to go to, you might get a much bigger job and have a phenomenal experience. Why? Because all the other fancy MBAs don't want those jobs, don't want to go there, don't want to make that sacrifice. 
That's part of what you have to do if you want to have a mega career. You need to go where everyone else is not going, which might be a geography. Number seven, you already know this, but I want to tell you it's important in your career. Learn to triage issues and cut corners. You have to do that. You can't get everything done. It's about making choices. Triage issues and cut corners. Which email should I work on? Which email should I not even bother replying to? Um, don't let other people steal your time. Um, OK, three, three things to go very quickly. Number eight. As you get older and you start getting involved with a significant other, I recommend you share your work with your significant other and have conversations and bring them into what you do. Trying to have a life and trying to have a job as two separate things will never work. Your job will eat up your life. And your significant other will have a very hard time feeling a part of what's going on and you're gone all the time if you don't find a way to talk about it and share it and, and, and come to the conversation curious. Let them give you your, I, I found my wife used to give me great advice about the people I worked with. They snowed me a lot of times by their sucking up and she could spot a phony in a minute. Number nine, uh, along the same lines, you need to take time for things outside your job. It, it, and this sounds kind of maybe like a, 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 an oxymoron, but as much as I said about getting up early, working hard, work, outworking everyone else, all that stuff, don't let your whole life go away. You know, if you have children, you got to find a couple of moments for your children. Find some moments to come back and spend time here at Penn. Connect with your, with your students. Uh, you you got to have some semblance of a life. So, don't, so I don't want this to make it sound like you're nothing but work. That doesn't work either. You got, especially once you have children, you'll be very unhappy if you don't spend time with your children. And finally, number 10, intensely focus on self-improvement, yours and someone else's. Someone else's. Find some other place to invest time and help somebody else also. It'll make you feel better about yourself. You will grow as a person. But also, every year, every year, just like every, a lot of people have their New Year's resolutions, you have your plan for self-improvement and write it down. This is how I'm going to get better this year. This is my plan to exit this year smarter and better than I entered it. So anyway, oh, final comment, final comment. We've talked a lot today about executive leadership and communications. The one thing none of us are good enough at, listening. Learn to listen. Here's a phrase you can write down, please. Come to the conversation curious. Come to the conversation curious. What that means is I don't, I don't come and talk to you and I let you talk just because I want to let you talk. I want to know what you have to say. I want to know what you think. I want to ask you questions. Well, why do you think that? Where did that idea come to you? How do you think that's going to work out? Not just, OK, thank you very much. Let's move on. No, come to the conversation curious. Really want to listen. Really want to listen. Get out of your head. Try to get into someone else's. That's a skill none of us work on enough. We all have to work on it more. Hold your applause for just a second. I'm going to have Dave stand up. So Dave, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to get you up. Uh, Dave, on behalf of us all, two notes of thanks. Uh, one is, thank you for the service you have uh, provided for years at this university. Trustee, overseer for the school, the Potbrook Center. Dave's uh, an affiliate of the Leadership Center. He's on the advisory board for leadership at the university here. So thank you for your long and enduring and deep service to the university. Today, though, number two, we want to thank you for helping us appreciate what it's going to take a, uh, to make a mega career, to change an organization, and above all, to make a difference in other people's lives. Dave, thanks for coming today. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. And by the way, my odd tradition is to encourage you to come up and have a handshake with Dave as a personal thanks to him as you head out. And I think he's got a few books to and, sign. And as if well. anyone, yeah, if anyone has a book I haven't signed, I will be happy to sign it at the end. Okay.
Come on okay. forward. Yeah, come on out. I'll shake your hand on the way out. 